Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this event organized by the Oxford Global Society. The title, The Era of Digital Surveillance, Authoritarianism versus Democracy, a rather provocative title, as you can see. I'm, I'm today's moderator. My name is Dennis Galligan, Director of the Oxford Global Society and Professor Emeritus of Sociolegal Studies at Oxford University. A brief word about the Oxford Global Society. It is an independent non-profit think tank dedicated to the analysis of subjects of interest and importance internationally. The society is Oxford based and draws on academics and researchers, policy analysts and others from Oxford and from around the world. Our aim is to present an informed account of complex matters in a manner accessible to the public. We welcome new members. We also welcome benefactors and sponsors. For details, if you're interested, please see our website, oxgs.org. Let me introduce our three distinguished speakers. Professor Ralph Schroeder, Professor of Oxford Internet Institute at Oxford University. Ji Han Zhang, Professor of China and International Studies at Lancaster University, and Professor Daniel Smilov, Professor of Political Science and Political Theory at Sophia University. Each of our speakers will present 15 minutes of ideas and argument. Then discussion will follow amongst them then comments and questions from the audience. So please audience, be ready with your questions and your comments, and we will discuss them uh, towards the end. The event will last an hour or just over an hour. So let me give a brief introduction to the issues that we're going to discuss. Our subject today is digital technology and how it is used by governments in surveillance of the people. Surveillance, the very word, comes from the French verb they to watch over, meaning to watch over, added to which is sur, meaning to keep close watch over. I think the very etymology of the word is quite revealing. So surveillance by government means keeping a close watch over the people. What that means has to be explained and how close the watch varies from one government to another. It's a constant feature of human history that inventions and advances, not least in science and technology, will soon be used and exploited by both the people and the government. Examples are all around us. Gunpowder and the petrol engine, electricity and the telephone, the internet and the computer, and many others. Such inventions have two sides, a bright side and a dark side. On the bright side, they contribute immeasurably to human well-being. On the dark side, they can be used to harm, damage, and destroy human well-being. That governments make use of digital technology to keep watch over the people is to be expected. It can be used for good or bad to advance the well-being of the people, which after all is the purpose of government, the only purpose, or it can be used against the people to their loss and detriment. A preliminary issue, which we shall only touch on here, but not offer a full account, is the nature of digital technology, how it is used and potentially could be used to keep watch over the people. As artificial intelligence enters the scene, the potential seems without limits, and that is only the start. The future development in technology and the potential are simply beyond our imagination. So the first question then for today is how and to what extent are governments around the world using digital technology? All governments use it in some ways and for some purposes. Both the purposes and the extent of each vary as a growing body of research shows. Although it must be said, research is still in the early stages. The second question concerns the people. How much do they know about digital technology? And what do they think? 
There is good research on the sentiments and opinions of the people in a number of societies, but more needs to be done. And just as the people rely more and more on digital technology in their daily lives, governments do the same. The people's sentiments as to the use of digital technology by governments are mixed. Some are of the view that keeping close watch advances the overall well-being of the people. Others, however, see it as an intrusion, a grave intrusion into their lives, their liberties and their privacy. The third question introduces a comparative element. China is often singled out for its extensive use of digital technology in surveillance, a use well illustrated in, but not confined to, the handling of the plague, the spread of the COVID virus. China has attracted a lot of attention and prompted empirical research. Comparisons are made with other governments, although there is much variation among them. There is not yet the same range and depth of empirical research of the practice across other nations as there is of China. This gives rise to several questions. What are the various practices around the world? How do they differ? What are the, what, what are the reasons for the differences? And what are the effects and consequences of the differences, the differences in the way government uses technology? The fourth question leads into the social structure of a nation and the different social structures. This draws our attention to the ideas and the values that guide social action and social life, that, that structure social relations between the people and their government. And here the concepts of democracy and authoritarianism enter, occupy the stage and dominate the debate. Several matters call for attention. What is the meaning of each concept, democracy and authoritarianism? Is the meaning settled enough for the concepts to be useful in understanding digital surveillance? Does each concept reflect accurately the social relationships between the people and government across nations? Or are there other ways of calibrating and expressing the relationship, ways that capture better the terms and understandings of the relationship and the variation across nations. A fifth question, not one we'll look at today, but a fifth question is how to contain and limit the use of digital technology by governments to ensure respect for the terms of the social relationship between governments and the people. Each nation has to work out its own method of containment. There might even be scope for the setting of international standards. So building on today's analysis, these are good subjects for future events. Thank you. Now I'm going to call on you, Ralph, to present your ideas. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Dennis and Yufang for inviting us. Uh, this is a a really big topic to do justice to in 15 minutes, but I'm going to try my best. So I don't have slides, but I thought I would uh, take the questions actually in reverse order because that makes a little bit uh, more sense to me to kind of go from the broader picture to the narrower issues. And I'm going to um, focus only on one aspect of this a big question, which is the role of media. So I'm not going to talk about police surveillance. I'm not going to talk about pandemic uh, apps and so on. I'm just going to talk about the role of the media. And secondly, I'm going to focus on, I'm not a China expert, but I have written about China. Um, uh, and I'm going to just focus on China on the one hand and Western democracies the US, if you like, or European countries um, on the other. And so if we go with Dennis's questions in the reverse order, then the fourth question was, does the division between authoritarianism and democracy 
help in understanding the practices of digital surveillance. In relation to media, at least, the answer, my answer is yes. Because from the point of view of political science or political sociology, if you prefer, that's now the spectrum that we have across the world. We have democracies and we have authoritarianisms. We have shades in between. It may be that on the, on the other side of authoritarianism, there are regimes that are even more strict with their media, such as North Korea, which is arguably a dictatorship. But we can just leave that out for the purposes of this discussion, or at least for my discussion. So yes, there's a spectrum, and it roughly runs from democracies to authoritarianisms. Now, the second question is, when it comes to digital authoritarianism, China is the focus. How different is China from the Western world? And here, the main answer, again, in relation to media, is that China simply does not have an autonomous media system. Western democracies do have autonomous media systems. And what I mean by that is that the media are in some respects uh, independent both of states and markets, that they have certain journalistic values or news values, if you prefer. And those news values include things like objectivity, diversity, pluralism, open expression, and a watchdog function. Now, many of these things are also present in China. I mean, China has very strong journalism. It has very many media, both commercial and state. But there's one thing that China lacks, which is a, a division between the media and the party state. And that, in research, is still a black box. We simply don't know what the relationship is, for example, between the party state and Baidu or Tencent or other companies and how that shapes particularly the algorithmic uh, way in which media news are fed, if you like, to the population and how that process takes place. We simply don't know enough about that. And that I think is a, is a question right at the state of the art of, of what we, we as researchers are doing or trying to do. Um, so a different way to put that is that, of course, uh, in democracies, there's a lot of discussion about how media should be regulated. Should social media be regulated? To what extent should they be self-regulating? Should they be regulated by governments and so on? In China, that is also a question, also in relation to media. But again, the discussion is not taking place independently of the party state, but in and through it. And that is a, a major difference between democracies with autonomous media systems and authoritarian party states like the Chinese, Chinese state, where media are not uh, autonomous uh, in principle. So that then leads to the second question, again in reverse order. So what shapes the public views about digital surveillance and daily lives? And I'm sure the other speakers have um, um, come across studies in this regard, uh, there have actually been many comparative studies recently, not many, but uh, uh, very powerful ones, especially by Genia Kostka of the Free University. And she has shown, for example, in relation to the social credit system, which is a little bit tied to media, uh, that the public supports and on the whole trusts the government or the party state in relation to how the social credit system is being rolled out. She's also written, for example, about surveillance cameras uh, and or CCTV cameras and how they're being used in the US, in Germany, in China. And again, it turns out that China, uh, the Chinese public, based on surveys at least, trusts the government more with that kind of surveillance and supports it. So uh, I think here, if the question is what shapes these attitudes, then there are lots of different uh, factors, of course, but I would simply point to one uh, 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 telling example, which is that in Germany, um, which
which is a democracy, uh, there's a lot of a lot less trust towards uh, surveillance and this and this particularly the role of the state in it and that obviously has a long-term background in fascism in nazism and the way in which uh, the state actively used surveillance there so these are very long-term processes and in china i think it would also be safe to say that there are very long-term processes in shaping that on the whole, again, public support for state surveillance, especially in relation to having the state protect people from um, dubious commercial practices. So that then leads to the, uh, to the final question, which is how are governments using surveillance technologies? Uh, and again, uh, focusing on media and digital media um, for the purposes of my discussion, uh, the main thing that characterizes democracies in relation to uh, how media are being used uh, in Western democracies is, of course, to gauge public opinion, is to gauge what the public thinks, is to uh, allow elites to listen to their publics so that it can inform them. And that applies as much to Twitter and Facebook in some ways as it does to newspapers, broadcast, and so on. Now, the interesting thing here, and I think this is uh, my last major point, is that in China, that is a little bit of a paradox. Because on the one hand, we have the view, we, when I say we, we, perhaps the Western public is what I mean by that, have the view that media in China are used in a top-down way, in a propaganda way to shape public opinion. And I think that is to some extent the case, but it's not the entire picture. And that's where it gets really interesting to my mind, because if it were the case, that media were completely unfree and that there was no scope for expression via media, then the Chinese state would have a problem because then it would not be allowed to gauge, it would not be allowed to measure, if you like, what the public's gripes are, what their complaints are, what they're concerned with and so on. And this has sometimes been uh, labeled the dictator's paradox that that might build up then a lot of pressure which would make the government less stable because it doesn't know what the public wants. And I think that's the interesting thing about digital media, particularly in China, is that on the one hand, I've said that media are not autonomous. We don't know how much the state is engaging in media surveillance, media control. But what we do know is that the internet in particular is the space or the site where a lot of political discussion takes place. It might be controlled in, in relation to sensitive areas, but the internet is full of lots of different voices, lots of different complaints, lots of interesting sentiments being expressed. If you've looked at the newspapers today, you may have seen a photo of a bridge where there was a poster across uh, the bridge in light of the, the party Congress taking place. And that poster was actually expressing in a very low tech way, if you like, protest against the state, protest against COVID regulations, protest against the fact that Mr. Xi is not an elected official and so on. Now that expression was immediately cracked down upon by the government. But at the same time, it was seen by hundreds of thousands of netizens. Many, many people online, both within China and outside, saw that protest. And it will have stimulated a lot of discussion. So there may not be an autonomous media system, but the state can use social media in China as well as in democracies to kind of look at public opinion and see what the public is interested in. And I think although that's taking place in different ways in China and in democracies, it's still a very important um, uh, aspect that I think we should take into consideration that we need to study and that allows surveillance 
actually to also be seen in a positive light as well as a negative one. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Ralph. That's a uh, that's very, very helpful beginning to our discussion. May I just raise one point before I move on? Um, so from what you say, it would seem that the public, despite the restrictions on the official media, if you like, the public still has access to media in the sense of social media. So how is that different? How is that different from, say, in the United States or in Britain? Well, it's different insofar as, first of all, you have to think about the fact that in China, most people and many more, a larger proportion of the Chinese public gets their news and their political information from mobile phones. And they get news and political information also from things like uh, Weibo and WeChat in particular. And those news are shaped algorithmically in terms of you know, measuring what particular audiences are interested in. And that algorithmic shaping is one way in which the state can directly interfere, but also measure and use the social media companies, the platforms, if you like, to see what the public is interested in. And in China, that the black box is in the relation between the party state and those platform companies. That's different from in the West where uh, the, the relationship between governments and social media companies is much more transparent. Uh, and, and, and that's a major difference between democracy and authoritarianism. Okay, well, that's, that's a good point. Perhaps we'll come back to that. But in the meantime, we'll go, uh, we'll go to our second speaker, Professor Zhang. Right. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for having me. I think part of what I'm going to say will be following the first speaker and mainly focus on the, on the case of China, on, on the rise of digital civilian state and uh, China's authoritarian practice. I would like to mainly raise three key points regarding um, my discussion. The first one is the rise of the digital civilian state in China is heavily embedded in its domestic political and social environment, making it very different from practicing other democratic and authoritarian states. And the second point I'm making here is there are a lot of bold practices in civilians in China, but it's not really there yet. What I mean there is a lot of analysis nowadays in news or uh, a discussion on China, what they were suggesting is about uh, what has been happening. That seems to me are closer to the science fiction than the reality. And the third point I'm making here is um, China now, there is a reflection and discussion with the development of the society on the shifting balance um, of a trade off between convenience and security. That, ha that has and will pose more challenge to the government when handling about this matter. So, those are three points I'll try to make. First of all, um, how China is different in China's case or why this case is so interesting. Obviously, as we all know, uh, the Chinese government is the most financially capable authoritarian states in the world. Its domestic security spending is more than its defense spending, and its defense spending is the second largest in the world. And, and also the scale of China's authoritarian regime is different from that in other parts of the world, such as Russia and Iran. It has been leading in this field and exporting different kinds of knowledge to Russia and Iran, such as the Golden Shield project, which we often know as Great Firewall of China. And the second um, key difference is that China has a strong, the government has a strong willing to push back social autonomy by employing AI or big data or different kinds of digital technology. And uh, for those who are interested in it, we can go back to the concept of uh, in the 18th Party Congress uh, called the innovation of a social management social management capacity, which focusing a lot more how the government can better manage the society in a way to reshape the society state relation, uh, which makes us uh, a quite important shift. And third one is obviously in China, there is a strong state power combined with relatively low social awareness. And as we all know, even in democratic states, we have already seen the, the rise of civilians, but in China, um, with the strong state power and weak civil civilians, you can see a lot of bold practices there, which I'll talk about. 
And this has need to very different kind of practice on a whole topic. For example, um, on AI front, which I'm recently working on, the, there is clearly a value difference in employing those uh, AI technology such as uh, facial recognition technology. If you go to China on day to day basis, you will be seeing all those facial recognition technology everywhere, airport, uh, bank, even in residential area, when you're trying to enter a residential area, there will be uh, facial recognition cameras there. So China is leading on this area, but we, can, we haven't really been seeing that uh, similar kind of pace in, for example, Europe. Back in 2019, uh, the European Union considered a black ban of the facial recognition technology. And eventually uh, it let, it let individual member states to decide what they want to do. And in the US, uh, it's use, the use of uh, facial recognition technology by police and city agencies has been officially banned in many American cities, such as Boston, such as uh, a lot of other places. And the Google also uh, CEO was in favor of a temporary ban. And especially I think in the US, there was a racial element of that, an ethnic minority. So uh, the Black Lives Matters, for example, regarding the uh, George Floyd's death. After that, that campaign, the Microsoft, Amazon, IBM had decided to limit his, their, the use of their facial recognition technology by the US police. But in China, we wouldn't be saying that Baidu or Tencent or Huawei or Alibaba come to say, we don't work with government on our technology. That wouldn't be happening. It's a very different state business and state social relations. That's the point I'm trying to make here. And also this is not only about surveillance part, it's also about general, the uh, AI part, for example. If you say US, China, Europe, you will find we have a different kind of approach to developing AI technology. For example, in the US, it's very much market oriented, supported by industry funding. And that was pushing the US uh, to develop its AI. But in China side, it's very much state oriented. And the key strength that Chinese government always emphasized is we have a large amount of data. That's something we can compete with its AI peer, such as United States. So the data has been something considered very important as a national resource that has been used and harvested to boost China's technological competitiveness. And this is quite important. And the EU, which has taken a very um, cautious approach, which in a way many summarize as an ethic oriented or consumer rights oriented kind of approach, uh, guided by GDPR, for example, this has led to many AI companies has been complaining about how this tight regulation has led their, uh, make them less competitive when competing with Chinese or American peers. But I want to make sure one thing is, although we see this difference there, we shouldn't be over-interpreting this. In China, I want to emphasize that there is also considerable concern over privacy. And in the past few years, there are more and more regulation now on the use of data in China. So in a way, you can say the Chinese government do share the similar concern with American or European governments over people's privacy, over the abuse of data. And this is why China has launched the data security law. Some of the analysis saying this is even more stricter than GDPR in a way. But the critical difference here is because of China's different society and state relation, the data security law of China mainly focus on regulating non-state actor. But GDPR is both non-state actor and state actor. So that is, that is a crucial difference here we have to uh, point out. So, I think in order to understand about what's happening in China, um, my key argument here is China's practice are actually part of the government's broad and incoherent adaption strategy to governance by digital means in the age of digital era, in the age of AI. And they do consider the use of technology in places like governance or surveillance as part of the modernization program, which make our government more modern, which our more government more progressive, and in a way, many of their benchmark are American government or European governments. So this is a modernization of enhancing its social management capacity. And it's not only targeting, obviously, public service, improve the public service, but also strengthening the authoritarian rules. And we have seen some very uh, positive examples of how this has been enhancing efficiency. For example, the local government of Guangzhou has been introducing this state regulation in the commercial field, in which in the past it takes about three days to process registration of business license. 
And now with AI plus Robert, the, they will be able to do it in only 10 minutes, which makes people's life a lot more easier, a lot more quicker. Or Baidu has been talking about how um, facial, facial recognition technology can be used to fight against child trafficking has been solving the critical problems that cannot be used in traditional ways, right? For example, uh, if a children is lost and after two or three years, that children might look very different. So with a picture of the past, you can no longer find the, 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 the children. But with AI, with those kind of technology, they can stimulate and they will be able know, to know what the children will look like uh, uh, with updated kind of uh, uh, photos. Or, those will be able to identify the facial recognition technology will help you identify the lost children from a, a missing person data, which has millions of photos. And if you compare that by human eyes, it's so tiring and it's very inefficient. But with AI, it's all possible with 99% nine accuracy with over a hundred thousand facial comparison per second. So uh, this has been used in that. But also we hear a story about how the, uh, the civilian has been used to regulating social media. Uh, for example, I think the previous speaker didn't mention that. Uh, and ever since 2012, the Chinese government has been uh, focused a lot more on regulating um, social media. Uh, for example, Weibo, in the past, you do not need your identification to do that. But now if you want to register a Weibo, which is a Chinese Twitter, you have to put your real name, your ID, which is linked with the Ministry of Public Security will verify you whether you are what you claim to be. So uh, basically um, that would mean that in order to have a Weibo account, you need to uh, submit all the kind of personal information and can be identified uh, who you are in a, in a real world. And the government made it very clear back in 2013, the goal of the scheme is to regulate the simulation of objectable information over the network. So they're very open about it. Also, there are other kinds of programs such as information platform of real time uh, citizen movement. So now in China, if you buy a phone, for example, a SIM card, you have to uh, bring your ID and that ID will be again being linked with Ministry of Public Security and uh, without register, without linking your ID, your personal identification with that SIM card, you will not be able to have a phone card in China. So um, obviously those will be helped to monitor about movements of the city, city movements in real time. And uh, another uh, interesting thing people often talk about is China's smart city project. Many argue that this will be further contribute and strengthen China's place with the largest video surveillance network in the world. And uh, data show that among the world's uh, most surveillance cities, eight of them are in China. And Beijing's Sky Network uh, project uh, is quite interesting by them. It will able to be able to monitor 100% of public streets in Beijing involving over 0.3 million camera, uh, 4,000 police in Beijing. And the Beijing police has been very clear about it. The purpose of this camera was there to prevent crowd gathering and street crime. And the real kind of barrier to implement those schemes are not legal side of people's opposition, but uh, the haze uh, because of the air pollution uh, that the camera cannot see through. So, um, uh, and also there has been nowadays, there's a lot more and more dis with a more discussion of that. Some of the practice in China has been linked with some movies or science fr uh, friction. I'm not sure how, how many of our audience has watched this movie back in by Tom Cruise talking about back in 2054, uh, in which that uh, we will be able to predict the crime before the crime happened. And talking about a movie that uh, a special police unit who will be able to arrest murders before they commit the crime. And um, many of them are talking about how this is becoming a reality nowadays with uh, the development of gut analysis, which will be able to access individuals' chances of committing a crime using facial technology, facial recognition technology, gut analysis to, you, to monitor individuals' movement and behavior to places such as high risk places, a uh, hardware store where kitchen knife will be sold, this and that. And um, some of the media like Financial Times are quoting Chinese vice minister of science and technology, Li Meng's words saying that if we use our smart system and smart facility well, we can know beforehand who might be a terrorist, who might, be do, who might do something bad. Um, yeah. I think I agree. 
See, mm -hmm. I look, oh. Could you, are you winding yeah, up? Yeah, I'm, I'm coming in a minute. So, but I think there is a big part here. Uh, the reason I'm having a big part is there is a big difference between the reality and the science fiction. And what is very interesting and ironic is if you see into, from the inside this point of view, what is the biggest uh, threat to the civilian state in China? That would be its bureaucracy. What you see here is a photo of uh, many cameras. But in reality, in China, they are not necessarily integrated into one system. Different departments might own different cameras, and they are not using the same standard, and they might not be communicating them with each other. So it's not a lot less effective than you would have been expecting. Uh, because of time, I won't be going into it. And the social credit system, again, uh, I think the present speaker also mentioned, I think a few points to talk about uh, as well, is still developing and it's not integrated yet. It's very fragmented system. Different provinces have a different practice and it's very popular in China. So it's different from a, a big brother narrative. Um, and it has a history go back to uh, a Slovenian system of individual archival. And last point regarding the public opinion. I think clearly the Chinese government has been paying a lot of attention to a shape national agenda, national debates. They made it very clear when we implement those technology, we should clearly shape the, the public opinion, make it civilians a good a, a force for good. And, but nowadays, I would argue last point is that with the people pay more and more attention on the data privacy and its damage, I think the Chinese government now is probably facing more kind of questions over how sh should, we lo should we no longer trade um, security with convenience. So I'm going to stop here. Um, sorry for the, the right. overtime. So, so very interesting. And, and I'm sorry you, you, you had to pack a lot of important information into such a short time, but thank you for such a good effort. Can I just ask one, one question that comes out? So you spelt out the advantages the positive signs, and you also spelled out the negative, uh, the disadvantages. Uh, it, to an outsider, it becomes a bit hard to judge uh, whether there's any real difference, therefore, between what's going on in China and what's going on in any other nation. It's this question of balancing the positive against the negative. Is there any real substantial difference in the relationship between the public, the people, and the government? Uh, do you want me to answer now or? Yeah, I want you to answer right. now. <laughs> well, I think I think uh, in a way, yes. If we look at uh, if we look at in a way of balancing between um, security and convenience or the balancing how to do it, I think in, in that kind of frame, uh, probably we wouldn't be see that much of of a difference. But I think much of the debate in China of the concern over privacy or data, uh, again as I mentioned earlier, uh, and mainly focus on non-state actors. So a lot more discussion or public debate in China nowadays over data leak, data abuse is more about how Alibaba, Tencent, those has been, you know, uh, leaking those data or uh, abusing their data. So a lot all focused on non state actor and has been supporting that the state should have more regulation on them. And this aligns with Chinese government's anti-monopoly kind of practices over those kind of big tech giants. And this actually needs to a consequences that the state will have more control over those tech giants and further tie its grip on how to make those tech giants to comply with the government policy. So this kind of debate probably in the West is, uh, you would say the government will no, not be left in a broad spot for that discussion. But in China, the government is actually left in a, a, a blind spot and the discussion of focusing on regu regulating lung state actor has been contributing the government's control and monopoly um, on the society. Thank you very much. We'll come back to that point perhaps in a few minutes. Daniel, you've been waiting patiently. You have the floor. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, re a real pleasure to, to, to speak uh, uh, to you uh, on this uh, interesting topic. My thoughts are not uh, so well arranged uh, as uh, the thoughts of the two previous speakers. And I was fascinated uh, by uh, uh, the developments in China uh, and so on. My perspective is uh, the perspective of, a, of an Eastern European. Uh, my country is Bulgaria, a former communist country. And uh, actually I was uh, thinking about uh, the, the changing nature of surveillance. Uh, uh, a lot has been written about uh, surveillance under communism in Eastern Europe. We had all these uh, 
uh, special services, collecting files on people, spending a lot of resources uh, to accumulate documents, pictures, and so on. Uh, and now with digital surveillance, it's actually citizens and people that are competing uh, among themselves who is going to produce more information about themselves on the net. So, so it's a kind of almost voluntary production of uh, surveillance. All this information is uh, there, it's out there, it's somewhere. And uh, the real question is uh, who has control and what uh, use uh, can be made of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, information. And I think this is an amazing shift and digital surveillance has, uh, uh, has made uh, uh, this reversal possible, uh, which uh, leads to the existence of massive information about uh, actually most of the citizens uh, if uh, not uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, my second point will be that, uh, well, starting from here, still there is a huge difference between uh, authoritarian countries, uh, authoritarian states and democracy in answering exactly this question. So the information is there. Um, uh, rich and powerful nations, they can afford to accumulate uh, such massive information. Uh, the question is how they treat this information, who has control and so on. And uh, in my understanding, at least, uh, democratic states, uh, they apply or at least they should apply. Uh, sometimes they fail, but generally they strive to apply basic principles of constitutionalism to the handling of this, uh, uh, this massive data. Uh, well, the, these principles are, of course, uh, uh, division of power. Uh, so no one should have a monopoly. There should be no monopoly uh, power over, uh, uh, over this resource. Uh, and especially the state should not be in position to uh, have a monopolistic control over this massive uh, resource. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, uh, uh, the rule of law should be observed. This should be regulated uh, area and uh, uh, whatever rules there are, they uh, should be uh, uh, observed. And finally, uh, which is very important, uh, uh, individual rights, individual group rights uh, should be observed in handling of this data. And uh, I think uh, we had already some illustrations uh, the difference between uh, democratic states handling of this data uh, and, uh, uh, and, and China and others uh, on the issue of uh, face recognition and so on, which uh, raises uh, exactly such questions of uh, individual rights. Uh, so my basic point uh, is that uh, uh, the dividing line between democracies and uh, authoritarian states uh, um, is uh, there, is present. Of course, uh, there are blurry areas and uh, there are complex issues uh, in which uh, the two models might uh, look uh, quite uh, the same, but still, uh, when we go to basic principles, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, the difference uh, is there and, uh, and could be uh, well uh, maintained. Uh, now, uh, I want to focus on, uh, on three uh, challenges uh, that uh, digital surveillance and digitalization actually uh, raises for democracy. And uh, three challenges that might look as an advantage of authoritarianism vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis democracy. Uh, I think these are serious issues. So these are issues that trouble me. Uh, and uh, I don't have uh, very firm answers, but I just want to uh, put them as uh, uh, questions. Uh, so uh, now with the uh, accumulation of uh, such huge uh, uh, data uh, on uh, individuals uh, and on their preferences, actually. So uh, um, it seems that democracy starts to lose its epistemic advantage. Uh, what I mean by that, 
uh, uh, it was a long established argument in favor of uh, democracy that it's a better form of governance because there is better feedback from the citizens uh, going to the government. So in a way, the government through elections and other democratic uh, uh, forms of participation uh, gets better feedback uh, from uh, the population. And in, in, in this way, it knows uh, uh, better what uh, uh, people really want. So it's more responsive uh, to the preferences and uh, uh, the desires of uh, the citizen. Uh, now with the accumulation of such huge data, especially uh, when, uh, uh, well, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, big data technologies, uh, machine learning and so on is applied to, 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 to this uh, rich uh, information. Um, this epistemic advantage starts to, 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 um, to become thinner. And uh, this is a kind of interesting theoretical question that uh, we uh, uh, probably have to deal, uh, uh, deal with. Uh, uh, ultimately, an authoritarian leader might say, look, I know better what uh, my people uh, want uh, because uh, they have been done, uh, uh, well, all sorts of studies have been done to show that, uh, for instance, even using uh, uh, information from uh, 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 social, uh, social media and social uh, networks, uh, if you study the responses of people, uh, how they like things and stuff like that, you could get a very good picture and you could come with very good prediction of what their preferences on specific uh, issues uh, uh, really are. So this is the, the first uh, point that I want to raise as a challenge uh, to democracy is the uh, weakening of this epistemic advantage that traditionally democracy had vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, authoritarianism. And the second uh, uh, challenge which uh, digital uh, uh, surveillance and technology raises is that uh, authoritarian uh, states, uh, which uh, do not have to observe constitutional constraints in handling uh, the, the, the data that is collected, uh, so they get a technological advantage. Uh, and we see this uh, technological advantage in, uh, in, uh, in face recognition technology. Uh, uh, the, the European Union for, and the United States, they ban uh, uh, the, uh, the use of, uh, uh, let's say, face recognition. Uh, and uh, uh, it will be more difficult or impossible to create massive models uh, uh, using artificial in, in, uh, intelligence with uh, uh, with uh, with big data and information uh, uh, in this area. China could go ahead and it could create very advanced models in this area and it, it will become a techno te technological leader. Yes, uh, it's a very dangerous path that is taken because obviously it... Uh, uh, it, uh, it is dangerous for individual rights and so on and so forth, but technologically there will be <laughs> a very interesting model uh, which uh, could operate with, uh, uh, with uh, face uh, recognition uh, data for uh, millions, billions uh, of people and uh, this would be accessible uh, only to uh, to China and the Chinese government, and this would give it certain technological uh, edge and uh, advantage. And, and that's a, an issue that uh, needs to be considered. I don't have a, um, a straightforward answer uh, to that. And uh, the final uh, uh, kind of uh, challenge that uh, um, I think uh, is coming up and it's becoming uh, relevant uh, is uh, 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 is uh, the questioning of uh, one assumption of liberalism and liberal uh, democracy. And it's a kind of really basic fundamental assumption. Uh, uh, in my mind, it is that the individual uh, himself or herself, they know best uh, uh, what is good for them and what is bad for them. Uh, so this is 
pretty central to, to virtually all, all theories of uh, liberalism. Uh, well, with, uh, with uh, uh, the massive use of uh, uh, digital surveillance in various capacity, maybe not now, but maybe in the near future, it might turn out that uh, governments uh, which have access to unlimited uh, information, uh, even uh, authoritarian governments will be better placed in this regard, they might know, uh, in fact, better what is best for, for the specific uh, individual. This is uh, a little bit like a variation of the epistemic advantage argument, but that's also something uh, uh, to, to, to be uh, considered. Uh, so I, I'm putting these questions there for discussion. I, I have my, my views on them, but uh, we'll come back it to will be interesting uh, to get your uh, reaction. So thank you, uh, thank you for that uh, quite provocative, but very, very uh, illuminating discussion. Right, I have, I have one question, Daniel, for you before we open it up. So, um, when you talk about the constitutional issues, the constitutional values, if you like, which make the difference between the, between the two, the democratic approach and the authoritarian, the point being that in the democratic uh, approach, according to you, the relationship between the people and the government is structured by a set of understandings, rules, standards, and practices. Um, uh, so just two points, is that the real difference then between the democratic and the authoritarian? And secondly, what is the equivalent of that in the authoritarian system? In other words, in other words, power has to be softened and mediated no matter where it happens to be. So is there any softening or mediating of power? in the non-democratic system? Those two questions, quick quick reply. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure that I, I can answer quickly uh, to that, but uh, um, right. it's, definitely it's, it's, it's a long discussion, but, uh, uh, but um, uh, well, maybe I could uh, give an example uh, with uh, the handling of, of, of data. Uh, it was uh, said by, uh, uh, by, by the, the previous speakers that uh, in China, the, the, the relationship between the party state and the media on the one hand, and uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the operators of uh, such uh, big data collected through uh, digital surveillance uh, technologies is not quite clear. This basically means that uh, the party state has uh, direct access uh, has uh, unlimited to a degree uh, uh, reach uh, towards such information and it could use it uh, to its benefit. So uh, to me, this would be one difference between a democratic state observing certain uh, standards of restricted power, constrained power, and uh, 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 authoritarian or totalitarian uh, state uh, in which uh, power is generally not constrained, although power could be divided. And uh, uh, in fact, we learned that there are different uh, bureaucracies in, in China, of course, and that they have their different uh, platforms, uh, their different uh, uh, technological standards and so on. But, this is not uh, uh, exactly the idea of uh, division of power, it's division of labor. So one is doing one thing, the other uh, is doing another thing. But when it comes to power, there may be a, a, a single center, center in, the party, in the party state, which uh, could uh, in, in fact uh, uh, exercise power. And, uh, um, and, 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 and th th these are important uh, uh, differ differences, not only normatively, I think, but uh, also when they operate uh, uh, in practice. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, that's great. Now, the, the floor is open to our three panelists. Um, Ralph, you, you've been uh, listening intently to the two following. Would you like to pick up any of the points and comment? Um, 
Well, I just want to echo uh, what Daniel also said. I mean, I think uh, he said very interestingly that the boundaries were blurring uh, in relation to how digital media can kind of gauge and uh, manage public opinion. And the same uh, was said by Jinghan. I mean, that, that, that in a way these tools are now available that allow you to have a very fine grained understanding of what the public thinks. And I think that's really uh, the common denominator between our three presentations, but I, I'll leave it there, thanks. Okay, Jihan, did you want to come and pick up any of the points Daniel or Ralph have made? Well, I think what I find fascinating is really about the striking similarities in a way. I think part of what discussion here is similarities of that civilians and the kind of power relation in democracies and also authoritarian regime. And that is, that is something I find fascinating and, and probably we can uh, have some kind of discussion about that later on. Well, just just before you that you you can't escape quite so easily. Uh, so, what is what is fascinating to you? What is it that particularly fascinates you about that? Well, I think if you look into the case, right, you will find that um, authoritarian regimes do share a lot of uh, similar concern with democracies, and uh, in a way, uh, how are going to deal with it, and. Um, how to what extent the security sector in democracies is transparent of the way they are using civilians mm -hmm. uh, and is that fundamentally different from that in authoritarian regime i do have a lot of doubts and i'd like to know a little bit more of that kind of practice in other other um uh, other countries so um so yeah in, the, in those those ways i think it's right okay uh, daniel um let me invite you to pick up any points that you, from Ralph or from Jihans. Anything else structure you'd like to raise? Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, it would be fascinating to learn a little bit more about uh, the, the, the credit system in, in China. Uh, I, I understand that it's... Uh, uh, not complete, that it's in its uh, early stages. Uh, but the fascinating thing there is that, uh, well, apparently citizens, they willingly cooperate to, 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 to have their huge files of information. And then uh, this uh, information is uh, fully accessible by uh, the government to uh, make all sorts of uh, decisions based uh, on it, uh, actually. So uh, I would uh, really appreciate to learn more about this issue and maybe the, um, um, the dangers associated with, with, with that. Because uh, in, uh, in other democracies, we still haven't uh, uh, seen um, uh, such, type of, uh, such type of an ambition on behalf of governments to create uh, uh, such massive stores of uh, information, quite sensitive information actually for citizens. Uh, okay. Well, um, so let's just, um, unless, unless you've got some comments on that, either Ralph or Jihan. Um, May I? Um, I mean, I think um, the social credit system has been much written about and um, what I would, say is that the way it's being written about in the Western media uh, in terms of what the social credit system does says more about fears of surveillance in the West than it does about what's actually going on in China. I mean, it's as Jing Han said, I mean, the system is not one monolithic system. It's mainly used at the moment for uh, actual credit defaults, people who aren't paying their debts. It's not yet being used to kind of judge people's moral behavior and so on in a systematic way. It's being trialed in different places in different ways. So I think we really have to get away from our preconceptions about some kind of Orwellian state. And that says more about what we, that is to say, West people in Western democracies, think about the role of social media and the way in which we're perhaps afraid of that than it does about what's really going on in China. Thank you, thank you. So, so in reading some of the material in preparation 
for today's discussion, I came across an article by Diamond and Donahue, and I'd just like to quote a sentence from that and get your reaction. So they say, the public sphere remains contested, talking about what we're talking about, even embattled in, in cyberspace, as it periodically does in the streets as well. So I thought that was a rather um, interesting way of linking what's going on in cyberspace with perhaps the age old question of politics and constitutional structures that, and I think as Daniel perhaps hinted at this, the relationship between the people and government is thought out in different arenas or different fields, if you like, from the streets to cyberspace. Um, so what is this, what do you think is the, 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 the sort of conclusion we might draw from the idea of this, let's just call it the cyberspace, uh, cy the field of cyberspace, if you like, following Bourdieu's idea of the field. Um, if we see it in that way as a contested area, as, as it had always has been contested, uh, one of the things that had interested me is the, the, the history of rebellion. And again, you see that at a certain point, a small group of people will be so fed up, they will rebel at great cost and with terrible consequences normally. But the point is that protest and rebellion and all sorts of forms of battle within the, the, the field of cyberspace presumably are taking place. And well, the question is, I suppose, are they taking place in China, say, we know they are in perhaps some of the Western European countries, there's a continuing battle over it, uh, sometimes in the streets, sometimes in Parliament, sometimes in the courts. But there is, so, so is, that a, is that a kind of way of looking at the problems of technology and how it might be you or how the resolution between government and the people might be worked out? Any comments? Ralph, any, any comment on cyberspace as a contested field? Well, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, cyberspace or social media or platforms or the way in which people express themselves in China uh, is the most interesting space to watch. I mean, the official media are not very interesting in telling us about what Chinese society is all about. There are boundaries around what Chinese people can express, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a really interesting and contested space because uh, a study many years ago found, for example, and this is maybe a bit provocative, but a study which surveyed American and Chinese populations uh, noted that per, on a per person basis, Chinese people talk, actively express themselves more about politics than do Americans. Another study found, for example, that if you look at what countries look at what material outside of their country, mm -hmm. then again, I mean, in the comparison just between China and the US, Chinese people click on more websites outside of China, uh, mainland China, than Americans click on material from outside the US. So we really have to think about the implications of, of just how the internet, which has been blamed for many things in recent years, and understandably so, can also still be a very contested space. Thanks. Well, thank you. That puts it very nicely, Ralph. Jihan, any comment on that? Cyberspace is a, is a contested space. A lovely idea, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I totally agree. I think there are two points I want to make here is if we go back to the Arab Spring at that time, I think the ICT was mainly held as liberation, liberating kind of technology, which will be there, link people together for rebellions. And that will eventually overthrow the authoritarian regime. But I think in China's case, which is interesting, is how you can actually use those technology to further strengthen 
the rule. And regarding, I think, the point of the contested uh, cyber space, I totally agree. And actually, in China, we shouldn't be uh, fundamentally dismissed that there is no wrong to be critical of the government. Indeed, many of the discussion on Weibo or WeChat, they can allow to take place if you are critical to the local governments. Mm -hmm. And for some of the uh, Chinese people or, or organization, in order to make a kind of uh, event uh, attracting attention from the top, they will try to uh, make a thing and um, or make a certain kind of events or incidents or even a protest go into a public uh, discussion, then that would be flag up the attention of the top leader, then they will come in to step in uh, to deal with this case and bypass local governments. Mm -hmm. So you can see that kind of cyberspace battle in, in this area, but at a local level, uh, it's not it never has been a questioning of the fundamental of the system. But yes, in the local level of the public service provider issue kind of issues, you do see a lot of criticism and uh, some kind of strategy to use, make things, make social media a way to empower the individual rights um, mm -hmm. when negotiate with, with local governments. And I think another research by Gary King's in Huffer also shows that if you are very critical of the governments um, on Chinese media, this is fine. What the government or censorship mainly focus on is not criticism, but the criticism which might need to the physical activity, which is mean large scale popular, popular protest. So that is something. So even if we mean a, po a post which might be positive to the government, but that will lead to the physical kind of protest or gathering, that will be something also the censorship is going to target. So it's a multi-dimensional thing. We should uh, develop a very sophisticated understanding of it. So we, we need to get beyond the thinking of protest out in the street, waving a banner. We need to think of protest much more subtly in, in the way you've just described it. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's quite an important point. Daniel, would you like to come in on this? Um, we're, getting, we're getting short of time and I want to have a few minutes for questions, but Daniel, a comment from you? Uh, well, briefly, I, uh, what I think is that the digital technology, including uh, surveillance, uh, it's uh, um, very good instruments for improving the efficiency of government, no matter what it is, whether it's democratic or, uh, or, or authoritarian. Uh, so it could uh, improve e efficiencies in various different uh, ways. Uh, but the whole question is uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there are trade-offs that appear. And uh, someone could be tempted to say, well, in order to improve efficiency a little bit further, we can even scrap some of the constraints that uh, come from uh, constitutional uh, democracy. And uh, at, uh, at the extreme, the argument could be even that uh, the most efficient form of government uh, would be uh, uh, authoritarian. And uh, this is what uh, worries me. I, I mentioned a few uh, arguments and I could see how they could be developed further, uh, but, um, um, but that's a very worthy uh, theoretical debate, yeah. Thank you, as well. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions, but they're not appearing clearly in a, in a legible form on my screen. I don't know if anyone else is able to open them and, um, um, I can see a few questions raised by Jerry Dung. Yes, he seems to be very prominent with his question. Why don't you choose a couple of those, if you wouldn't mind, Jihan? And right. Okay. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I would like to refer the 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 the, the audience to to my latest book, actually on. Um, uh, AI with Chinese characteristic. I think most of them I have discussed. I think there is no disagreement between me and uh, the point made here. I, I agree that AI is not only about processing business uh, registration. Clearly, as I mentioned, AI has a, a big role playing facial recognition technology, all sorts of that. Um, and it's not only about the private sector abuse of uh, privacy. It's definitely the state one, but the China data national security law as I mentioned, has been focusing on regulating non-state actor, leaving the state use or state abuse behavior in a blind spot. So I don't think there is a disagreement there. And regarding last point, I think Jerry John mentioned about how most of the AI complaints of Chinese revenue from public civilians are from, oh, sorry, revenue are from public civilians. I, I think definitely that's the case. If you go look into the capital uh, skill of China's AI industry will find a big decline uh, even before the pandemic, which would be 2019. So in the past kind of two decades, uh, the Chinese 
investment in AI is going up like that. And 2019 suddenly goes down before the pandemic. And the reason for that was there was too much hype on the technology of AI and how AI can do, can change everything. So a lot of investment there. But then they suddenly realized very few of the AI kind of investment or technology can be uh, find a sustainable commercial use or sustainable commercial revenue. A lot of them has to work with Chinese government um, on different kind of government project. That's where the main revenue comes from. And when the investor eventually realize that, that need to the, the capital winter of the Chinese AI industry. And obviously there is a great politics angle here. We all know Trump sanctioned a few AI Chinese startup because of the surveillance in Xinjiang, this and that. So I would recommend this uh, audience to read my latest book. Right. Well, that's a that's a nice advertisement for your book. May I recommend that to the audience? That the, and remember, the Jihan gets very good royalties out of this, so you're doing him a big favor. Anyhow, I'm sure I haven't read it yet myself, but I will go and buy one immediately. Uh, anyhow, I think um, we need to perhaps draw to a close. But I just like to give the three panelists the last opportunity. Final comment, Ralph. Well, I also recommend to <laughs> I've read quite a bit of it. Uh, there's also a new book, which I haven't read, but I've heard the podcast from, and that is very relevant to this discussion. And that's Lin and Chin, I believe, mm. Surveillance State. They're Wall Street reporters, and I had a very good podcast. And they make some of these points that are also raised in the Q&A here about the relation between commercial companies yeah. and the state and the way in which not just in the West, but also, uh, sorry, not just in China, but also in the West, this surveillance technology and AI companies exercising surveillance are going to be the subject of controversy for some time to come. And uh, I found that discussion really helpful. That is an interesting relationship. And of course, a great subject for a future webinar, I think, the, the private, we've deliberately restricted ourselves to government and the people, but I think as equally, a major interest in private sector and the people. Um, Daniel, final comment? Uh, well, I, I just wanted to mention uh, events in uh, Russia today as an example of uh, an authoritarian government abusing, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, digital surveillance, but also so social media information and so on, to put pressure on uh, pockets of uh, free civil society. So. Uh, this should also be kept in mind. As a, yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Daniel. And you have the last word. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think in a broader scale, clearly we can say that both authoritarian and democratic states are now balancing of good side advantage and disadvantage of the civilian technology, which make it very interesting. And in the China's case, obviously, it deserves a little more attention because China has gone a lot more further uh, due to uh, lack of kind of social resistance on that. But I think we should also calm down a bit and observe it in a calm eye. Do not link too much of China's practice with suspicions or science friction, because that is out of touch. And we often in the West see it from a Western eyes of saying something we want to say, or I'm trying to understand from a Western mind, which will be out of reliance to what has been happening. And I do see that, but in the longer run, yes, Chinese society will be facing the same kind of question the Western society is, is, is dealing with. And I think with, uh, with the development of civil awareness, development of social, de uh, social development, and uh, more and more Chinese people will probably ask the same question that has been asking uh, in, in Europe and the United States, but uh, uh, we are not there yet. Well, thank you very much. I think that's a good note on which to end. Let's, let's keep a balance in re reviewing these things. Let's look at the evidence. Let's try to understand the societies with their differences and their similarities. Gentlemen, thank you very much for taking part, for your presentations, all the work that went into preparing it, and for your the animated discussion we've had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, bye bye for now. <laughs>